Hey, what is up guys, I'm KBHD here, and this is the new Google Pixel phone, or two phones, the Pixel and the Pixel XL. They're picking up where Nexus left off with this whole stock Android experience thing and showcasing the absolute latest of what's good with Android. So while Nexus phones were Google working with manufacturers like HTC and LG and Huawei to make the phone, Pixel here is the first phone made entirely by Google inside and out, top to bottom, the whole thing. So what we're getting is a mostly unibody aluminum phone here with some chamfer action all the way around the sides and an overall pretty round, pretty familiar shape. <clears throat> Uh, an antenna line goes across the bottom of the back, and you have the, the G logo, the Google logo now at the bottom, replacing the Nexus, RIP Nexus. And then you have the top half of the back with this glass panel around the fingerprint reader. So it's a pretty interesting dual-tone look, dual-texture look. I might have to let it grow on me for a little bit, but wireless charging wasn't mentioned at all at the event, so I'm not sure if this has any utility, but just a different look. And up front is the AMOLED display, which looks great. And on the white version of the phone, above the display, you can see some cluster of sensors, Although the black version of the phone, I think, definitely hides this a lot better, as you'd expect. And I think I like the overall look of the black phone a little bit better anyway. It's kind of my thing. And I can't seriously be the first one to mention that chin. Wow. Like, is it really necessary to keep the phone symmetrical? I actually liked the Nexus 6 look of having a smaller chin, because it's not necessary to have a big chin. The fingerprint reader is on the back. The home and navigation buttons are on the screen. So I would have loved to have seen a smaller chin up here, but oh well. So the only difference between the Pixel and Pixel XL is the size, the display size up front, and the battery size. The 5.5-inch display of the XL and the 5-inch display of the Pixel. Everything else, the specs, the camera, everything else is identical. So speaking of specs, this is shaping up to be possibly the fastest phone ever again. It's rocking a Snapdragon 821 chip, so it's the first phone to do that. 4 gigabytes of RAM, and 32 or 128 gigabytes of storage. It has USB Type-C at the bottom where the speakers are, as you can see, and quick charging claims to get seven hours of charge in 15 minutes. Oh, and don't worry, it still does have a headphone jack. Feels crazy every time I have to say that, but it's true, it's still up here at the top. And the camera on the back claims, claims, to be the best on any smartphone by their pre-production DxO Mark ranking. Now, I can't even keep track of how many smartphones have claimed that anymore, but it is promising. It's a 12 megapixel camera with a really big sensor, so 1.55 micron pixels, which are some of the biggest I've seen in a while. It's basically ultra pixels at this point. F2.0 aperture, 4K video, and that LED flash. And with the software optimization, they're saying there's basically zero shutter lag, so you can take photos super quickly. So that's definitely something I gotta test more when I get it. The few photos I did take in this environment, they look decent, but this is like the worst lighting possible. So I'll have to get out and test that for the full review for sure. And yeah, this is all launching with Android 7.1 on board. So it looks like it'll be the first and only phone right out the box to get that. And playing with it, I found it pretty nice. Now the round icons and the couple new UI tweaks, I can get used to that. I mean, at least all the icons are the same size now. But the rest of Android 7.1 is a bunch of new features and little additions to 7.0. The main one of those being the Google Assistant. Now, Google Assistant isn't new. It was in Google's Allo app. You can use that already. But now they've built it into the OS itself. So it's replacing what was essentially Google Now on Tap, where that used to be. So now anywhere in any app, on any screen, you can long press the home button to get the little pop-up for Google Assistant. And for there, you can ask it a question, you can ask it about people, places, things, ask it to remind you something, or start playing music, Chromecast, whatever. It's your assistant, it does all that stuff. Now, you can still get the Google Now on Tap features by swiping, so if you still want that awesome screen recognition stuff, you can long press on the screen and swipe up and you'll have the Now on Tap features. But yeah, the assistant and all its machine learning awesomeness is a major new feature, a major point for Android 7.1. And the rest of the things I noticed were pretty little. Like in the settings, there's a new tab over to the right called support, where you have direct links to calling or video chatting with tech support. The new home button animation, you saw it when I long pressed it, but there's this new fancy animation every time you regular press home. And it's quick, but it's nice. You can't really miss it. And this new animated lock screen thing, check this out. Look at the, like, the canyon picture when I unlock it. See it moving? Like, that's crazy. That has to be new, right? Or at least the images built in for the support are super good looking now. But anyway, that's what's good. The first impressions for me right off the bat with the Pixel phone and with the Pixel launcher are a bit of a mixed bag for sure. Uh, of the three new colors, I would say the black one is my favorite. Not a surprise. But not gonna lie, that blue is actually pretty good looking in certain light. 
but you're gonna wanna love it to spend that premium price that this phone is gonna come in at. It's starting at $649 unlocked, which makes sense for the build you're getting and the specs you're getting, but you're gonna have to really like it. So I'm hoping to get my hands on this and the Daydream View headset later this year and Google Home and Chromecast Ultra and everything they announced, but in the meantime, let me know what you think of Pixel and Pixel XL. Is this your next phone? Is this enough to convince you to spend your money? I think the full review will be a lot of fun, so definitely subscribe for that, and be sure to share this video, your one-stop shop for all information, all things Pixel, until it comes out anyway. Thank you for watching, I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Peace. What we have here is a phone that's really taking a different look at the Android ecosystem, and it is very different in and of itself, inside and out. But it is a very intriguing phone, and that's why we have here your first look at the Turing phone. Now the Turing phone, very aptly named by the company Turing Robotics, is a different take on an Android smartphone that might look a little bit more like a boutique brand like Virtu, but comes in at a more affordable price point. It also prioritizes security on the inside as well as out, which is the reason why some of the design choices on the outside are very different from what you might expect. But first, before we get into the design itself, which is really all I can show you of this phone because they didn't really have a full working camera or even software inside of these particular prototypes that they were showing me. Uh, what I can show you about the software is the kind of design language that they might be looking for. This is a demo of the software that they're using and you can see I can swipe left and right to change the different areas that I'm in and even swipe halfway in order to get to certain settings. They say that the uh, final software is going to look very different from this but at least I can show you what their design language might end up being like and I have to say it does look kind of sleek uh, and is a different take on an Android operating system. But let's take a look at the device itself. Now, uh, it definitely has the look of, let's say, a high-end sports car, and it definitely feels like one as well. Uh, the phone will remain pretty light, uh, not too light as to suggest that the materials are not sturdy, and that in and of itself is a big portion of the Turing phone's appeal, the fact that more than half of the phone on the outside and also in is made up of a material called liquid morphium. It's a very strong material that is able to withstand a lot of shock and a lot of punishment without even breaking or much less getting too many dents and scuffs, uh, at least compared to plenty of the other types of materials that we see in the Android space. They even were gracious enough to give me a small piece of liquid morphium to mess with myself, uh, and you can see here I have a hard time breaking it, much less even bending it, and the sound that it makes when it falls on the ground is a little bit telling of just how sturdy this material is. Now the entire phone is not made of liquid morphium. Actually on the back, on the top and bottom, we have polycarbonate and in the middle is a aluminum panel. Moving over to the sides, you'll see that there is a, a fingerprint reader on the side, on the left side of the phone rather, uh, and I was able to get a demonstration of what that usage looks like. Now, what interested me about this was when he was trying to get into an unfinished version of Turing's own security software, uh, there was a two-factor authentication required. You first use your fingerprint and then you have to put in a code. It really goes to show you just how much Turing wants this phone to be as secure as possible, and it also has to do with the design, because you'll notice that around the entire device, there's really no headphone jack, because they want the phone to just be Bluetooth audio capable. They told me that uh, headphone jacks and using wired headphones is kind of passe. Uh, and then on the bottom, there is no micro USB charging port, or data port, I should say, because the magnetic strip that's down there is for charging and no data transfer. Data transfer will be done with Turing's own proprietary software that utilizes Wi-Fi for you to transfer data from, let's say, your computer to the phone. So really, this phone is supposed to be self-contained, where everything on the inside is just what it is, and there's nothing that will tamper it from the outside world. That also includes some protection, as the waterproof uh, phone will be able to withstand depths and also some shocks because of the liquid morphium outer body. But one interesting fact about the waterproofing is that all of the innards are coated as well. So even though there are some open areas in the design where water might seep in, it's not going to keep the phone from working. And you just have to shake off the water and you should be good to 
go because not only is the outside coated in, uh, for the waterproofing, but every little part on the inside is as well. So we are going to get our hands on a review unit pretty soon, but the phone is going to be available for pre-order starting on July 31st. The 16 gigabyte version will go for $610, which is a pretty low price point considering that phones with this kind of attention to detail tend to go for even more. Like for example, phones by Virtu. From there, you can go from 16 gigabytes to a 64 gigabyte version that will go for $740 and a 128 gigabyte version that will go for $870. So uh, this is a look at the Turing phone, uh, mostly at the design because these particular prototypes were all that I was able to look at. A very short look at software, not even the final finished product, but you will just have to wait for my review unit to get here and I'll give you all of the details about the Turing phone at that point. So make sure you keep it tuned to Android Authority for even more more about the Turing phone and keep it tuned here for even more from all of us here at Android Authority because we are your source for all things Android.